before the medications came along, which is not that long ago, at least in my lifetime, mid-50s, there was a tremendous interest in trying to understand schizophrenia in human terms, psychological terms, uh, what was happening in the mind. <clears throat> now, once we had medications that were effective, interests swung to the biology. <clears throat> and so the linkage between the two, the actual biology, what's happening at a neuronal level, and what you see in the actual behavior are, is a whole, used to be talked of as a black box, somewhere between what we know of the brain and then what we see people doing is a very, there's a black box that's diminishing as more and more studies occur. But the interest um, in, in understanding those symptoms in human and psychological terms was, was somewhat lost from 60s, 70s, 80s on <clears throat> because of the medication, because the medication actually is very, very effective. I mean, in terms of treating psychosis, the medication is as effective as most drugs are for treating other medical illnesses, and especially serious and chronic medical illnesses. <clears throat> now, the, the drugs probably target an intervening uh, pathogenesis, a piece of the pathway to schizophrenia or to psychosis, not the underlying uh, deficit. So they do quell the active disorganization, anxiety, panic of psychosis, but the medications don't themselves improve the underlying deficit. But the underlying deficits can be improved over time as long as there aren't relapses. Hence, <clears throat> the treatment really is medication to keep the, the uh, state of hyperarousal and disorganization from occurring, <clears throat> while the underlying problems and the consequences of those, because if you have had trouble with interpersonal, actually I'll put that a different way, I'll tell you about specific experiences. If I talk to a, a 27 or 28 year old who was last well in a, when he was 15 or 16, what, what I'm hearing are the interpersonal experiences of a 15, 16 year old. Because without the contextual information processing ability, his interpersonal range remains where it was when he was well. <clears throat> but all of those skills can be gradually improved over time, providing there are no relapses. Now with each relapse, we probably lose a year or two with somebody with these illnesses. So the medications are there to prevent the relapses, <clears throat> while all the other programs can gradually improve the connectedness, the interpretation of interpersonal experiences and clues, and, a, and <clears throat> when it comes to delusions, I always think one of the, delusions are very hard to give up, <clears throat> but then so is every other idea. <clears throat> Any, any serious ideas any of us have <clears throat> upon which we base our lives, uh, such as I am voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> no matter what evidence you show me, I will still vote for Donald Trump. No, I mean, <laughs> and actually it's in the psychology studies that, that demonstrate that, that it isn't actual evidence that change our, changes our minds about things. That's not, we, do, we don't give up our, our mental maps of how the world, world works very easily. So somebody who has been delusional doesn't give that up quickly and easily, but can over time. There is a process of 
maybe <clears throat> that wasn't right, or it was right at the time, but it's not right now. The police were after me, but they're not after me now. So I'm starting to give up the idea that the police are monitoring my behavior. They were doing it then, I'm sure. <clears throat> but no, I don't think they're doing it now. On to giving up the idea, maybe it never happened at all. Maybe it was my, but it takes a long time to give up a held belief. <clears throat> but we can get there as long as the medication keeps us from having a relapse. And as long as we are more and more engaged in the real world, uh, doing what, I mean, it doesn't matter that much whether it's a, a group therapy, an art therapy, a work therapy, uh, a cognitive therapy, uh, it doesn't really matter as long as we are <coughs> engaged, as long as that patient is engaged in doing something that creates <coughs> a more, I was, I can't find another word other than normal, normal <laughs> mental map. I hesitate to use the word normal. <clears throat> uh, a mental map and a way of engaging with the world. Probably turn it back to you because we were just talking about the issue of the insight. And as I said at the outset, I don't work in my practice with individuals with schizophrenia, but I have seen with my neighbor and in my doctoral research, individuals who lack insight into their illness. And I had asked Dr. Dawson, with his theoretical explanation, to, to talk about insight. So I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> it's, it's not, yeah, an insight, is, well, and that example I gave with the delusion is insight is, is not an either or. Uh, it's an approximation to my social view of the world that you are now beginning to accept. And so I say you have insight. <clears throat> so it, it's an approximation. Now how do we get people to accept treatment when they're denying there's anything wrong or are delusional? Well the first, now I have that experience from where I'm sitting, I mean clinically as a, as a psychiatrist, over and over again for 50 years. I've had that experience. How do I talk somebody into taking medication? In fact, I, uh, tongue in cheek, I say my job is to talk 50% out of the, of the people into stop taking drugs they shouldn't be taking and 50% into taking drugs they should be taking. But <clears throat> how do I talk them into it? Now, first, there are a few rules of thumb that help. I mean, besides non-threatening, non-authoritative, uh, not dismissing their experience, and not labeling them as crazy, <clears throat> or you have a mental illness, therefore you need to take this. But, it, but translating their experiences into a, uh, into a level, into words and language that we can agree on. You're not sleeping well. And you're very anxious when you step out and go to the grocery store. And I know you're very upset about, well, I mean, there's an example, the children's aid. I agree, they're the problem, the children's aid. They're the ones who messed your life up. They're the problem. But you're not happy. You're not well. You've told me, you don't, you know, you're very anxious, etc. These medications will help you sleep and be calm. Now, <clears throat> that is hardly informed consent. So I'm in trouble in another, <laughs> my professional body would give me trouble about that. <clears throat> but it's not dismissing the person's experience, it's translating their notions of the world into something we can both accept at. It's looking for a mutually agreeable social reality. Very hard for families because you've also been talked, you've also been trying to tell your family member to eat his spinach for 20 years. And so you have a long relationship. 
of a parent child, and you know, if it is a parent child relationship, you have a long of years of parent child relationship in which, in which your requests are part of a complex dynamic, whereas I'm not. Mine doesn't have the complex dynamic other than I have to be careful not to be the doctor ordering somebody to take the pills. <clears throat> and also it becomes a bit of a negotiating. Well, you don't want to take that one. Is there any pill that has helped you in the past that you would be willing to take, that you do like, that you, et cetera, et cetera. It's a lot of negotiation, uh, taking time, not labeling, not being dismissive. It does not always work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you go about it. When, and you might talk to some of the more recent research, when I did my doctoral training, I looked more at sort of a cognitive remediation or rehabilitation where we tried to retrain the ability to sustain attention and to alter attention. And it was a small sample size, eight in the, you know, each group. Um, but we did see benefits in terms of the ability to learn some new cognitive skills, which then did lead to some improvement in terms of some of the assessment of negative symptoms and functioning. So it's different than the cognitive behavioral therapy. It's often referred to as cognitive rehabilitation or remediation. Oh, okay, so would that work for someone struggling with uh you know, kind of rational thought and deductive thinking that they find this very difficult? That would be more, I think, some of the cognitive therapies or the cognitive behavioral therapies. Right? I'll turn it over to you. Well, <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, the whole idea of the cognitive disabilities is, is, is a very complex area, what kind of cognition, what particular brain function is affected or not affected, but it reminded me of something I saw years and years ago, which I think is one of our problems in managing people with this area, and that is a patient I saw in a psychiatric hospital had been hospitalized, institutionalized since age 10. I see him when he's age 20 for the first time, but he's been institutionalized as a child since age 10. At age 10, <clears throat> the medical records show that his IQ was 100. So average, right in the middle. At age 20, his IQ test showed he was, his IQ was 50. Now I'm sure it wasn't, and there's strictly biological brain deterioration. I'm sure it was the fact <clears throat> that no learning had occurred from age 10 to age 20. And that's one of our problems with schizophrenia. People who aren't in, if you have a, um, a poor recovery with schizophrenia <clears throat> and you have many, many years of not engaging with the world, and not using the brain to engage with the world, then there is a deterioration of cognitive ability. So some of that is, <clears throat> is secondary, not a specific brain deterioration, but a deterioration in abilities because of the lack of engagement that has occurred for a long period of time. <clears throat> so again, engagement, <clears throat> uh, Engagement is what we aim, what you aim at, whether that is with a therapist, and, and to my mind it doesn't matter too much whether it's specifically a cognitive behavioral therapy or, some, or a work project or a focus on something else or art therapy. It's the engagement of hand and brain and activity and project with another person that is remedial. I read, <clears throat> I read that question, there really isn't enough information there to be able to answer in any exact way, but uh, <clears throat> 
if it was marijuana use that precipitated a developing psychosis that was already developing, as opposed to a true drug-induced psychosis, which shouldn't last that long. If it was a drug-induced psychosis, then it should be over and done with, providing we don't use those drugs again. But if it was a de somebody with a developing psychotic illness and the, and the marijuana triggered the acute psychosis, <clears throat> then the marijuana trigger is not is neither here nor there. It's what is a true schizophrenic psychosis. Now, in 19, late 1960s, the pattern, the pattern for me over the years, I think, was, okay, if you're well for six to eight months, we can try you off the medication. Very quickly that became, okay, if you're well for two years, we can try you off the medication. That very quickly became okay. If you're well for five years, <clears throat> we can try you off the medication. This now for me is, after 10 years of wellness and compliance on the medication, if you would like, we can gradually try a weaning down, very carefully monitored at least every two weeks, and you will have medication in your uh, medical, in your, in your cabinet to take. And the early signs, as you and I have discussed, of the psychosis returning are, so actually my, so unfortunately, if this was a true schizophrenic psychosis, not just a drug-induced psychosis, one of a kind, then no matter what you read, my experience says, no, we don't stop the medication or we will have a relapse. 